this record first and um, I'll get us started by welcoming everybody uh, to this uh, webinar, the second in our season this year. And we're joined by Santiago Sandy Arena um, from uh, very far away from Edinburgh, I'm sure far away from many of you. He's based in the University of Costa Rica, um, where he moved to in 2016. For Santiago, as many of you know, has a lot of wide ranging interests in chemistry education at secondary level in terms of pet reach and um, uh, social levels. Um, but his interest that we're interested in, particularly for this evening, is his work in um, learning in the chemistry laboratory. And none of you who've heard him speak will know he's a really amazing speaker in that regard. So I'm very happy you can join us, um, Santiago. Um, for, for people in the, in the audience, there's a chat box that you can access, this purple arrow in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. And if you click on that arrow, you'll see a chat box. So as, as the webinar is going on, feel free to ask questions there, any comments. And then at about halfway through and at the end, I can pass those comments on to Santiago and we can have a conversation. All right, so Santiago, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll pass over to you. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for, for your introduction. I must also thank you for the invitation to be part of this uh, webinar series. It's, it's a pleasure for me to be able to um, address this audience, which I cannot see, and it's always fun to be talking to a, a screen. Um, I'm going to tell you some of the work we've done in terms of using phenomenological approaches to learn more about learning in the laboratory. Uh, and hopefully the first part of the talk is going to deal with phenomenology as a research tool. And the second part, I'm going to tell you some aspects of a study that we've done and where that study has led us to. As uh, Let me make this work here. OK, as you all heard, I, I, I'm currently in Costa Rica, which is just 10 degrees north from the equator. And it's nested between two very large masses of uh, bodies of water, lots of mountains, which make for the perfect weather. Um, it's only 11 hours uh, flight time to London, a um, beautiful place to visit if you ever want to come. And here, oh, let me make this work. So it's a delay in uh, advancing the slides. Um, I joined the faculty with the School of Chemistry at the University of Costa Rica, uh, and I am in the middle of my fifth semester. Um, and here I'm teaching the uh, introductory laboratories and lectures for chemistry majors only. The University of Costa Rica is a large public university, um, around 43,000 students uh, distributed in um, several campuses across the nation. And it saw its um, beginnings back in the 1850s, which on this side of the pond is a very, very long time ago. Uh, if you don't know what to think of a university in Costa Rica, I always tell people to just go by what they would think of a large state university in the US, because our system is pretty much modeled after the American system. This is um, General Chemistry Lecture Hall. It sits about 120 students. Um, instruction is typically very traditional, with very few exceptions. And that applies, I am very sadly to report, to the laboratories as well, but not to the majors' laboratories. So the chemistry majors get um, experiences which are very different from the non-majors. For instance, the first year, the laboratories last for six hours. So that's the contact time. But anyhow, I'm very interested in international chemical education. So if any, anybody would like to talk more about that, I would be delighted. But let's move on to the topic of today's talk, uh, learning in the college chemistry lab. I first got interested in this topic about 12 years ago. And that was because I had an experience working for um, corporate America, and which uh, gave me a chance to travel to many different countries in Latin America and within the US, where I met a lot of um, very highly qualified, very highly skilled chemists with advanced degrees that had problems with problem solving. So I got interested in where is it that we take a student, how does that happen? We take a student and we make a scientist out of that student. Where does the transition happen? And problem solving is one of the big aspects. So it renewed interest and, um, in chemical education. I went back to chemical education and uh, started working on problem solving, which took me to the laboratory environment. One of the first things that 
I realized back then was that uh, we didn't know much about learning in the lab. If you look at literature over the past century, um, you will see that there are these papers that uh, quite often bring up the same idea that we don't have enough evidence to make decisions in terms of um, pedagogical decisions in terms of the uh, laboratory in chemistry, all the way back to 1915 with that paper from Spears, um, from Spear uh, entitled Problems in Experimental Pedagogy of Chemistry, all the way through the century to 2012, where this DBER report, the Discipline-Based Educational Research Report, commissioned by the National Research Council in the US, um, concluded that we didn't know much about uh, learning in the laboratory in the sciences, and that it had been pretty much uh, unexamined. There was not enough research conducted. But not only that, they also concluded that the conclusions that could be drawn from the work that was available were not very robust. So it was not only a problem of the amount of work, it was a problem with the qualities of the work that was available. We're conducting a study that, that looks at this literature and hopefully eventually is going to get submitted and we all will have access to it. Um, one of the big points that we try to make every, every time we get a chance is that we need more research that is discipline specific and that is specific to the learning environment and that is specific also to the educational level. With this in mind, we set out um, about 10 years ago uh, to try to make a contribution in terms of filling this research gap. And we tried to start building this program, um, identifying some pillars that would define it. One of the things we noticed from looking at the literature was that um, in many cases, what people were doing was they would create a very interesting intervention with the best intentions, then they would implement it in the lab, and they would, do, they would do assessment. And research would become the assessment of that intervention. And quite often, the intervention was something that was very small and simple. And the expectations were that that single individual change would produce big outcomes. Uh, we thought that was not very realistic, and we identified with Chan and Le Leatherman when they called this a, an oversimplistic assumption. You can tweak something in the lab, which is a very complex learning environment, and get something significant out of it. So we sort of decided uh, to look at things in a different way. We decided we would go in and look at different learning environments in the lab, which we did not. Um, participate in. We were not instructors, we were not the designers, we would just go into these different env environments, do research, try to gather understanding of what was happening in the laboratory, and then use that information to propose modifications, curricular reforms. So it was sort of uh, turning things around a little bit. We were not the first having this idea. Nackley and collaborators back in 03, they said that the goal of research is to thoroughly understand what occurs in the lab and then work on revising curriculum and pedagogy. And even before Nackley and collaborators, that's, that's uh, registered in literature, other people coming up with exactly the same idea. We need to understand what's going on before deciding on making changes or proposing changes. Another aspect that we identified was well, I must say we did quantitative work to start with, and we also used mixed methods initially. But we got this feeling that there was some kind of evidence or information that we were missing. We, we could not target exactly what we wanted. And, and then we realized that we needed, to, we needed to take qualitative approaches more seriously. Um, and that rhymes with Nackley and, and collaborators' um, statement from, again, back in 03 when they said that the effect or value of the laboratory experience might not be measurable in a quantitative sense, which is a call for um, more qualitative approaches. And we all know that's, that that is essentially what's been happening over the past uh, 15 years or so, where we've seen a boom in the use of qualitative methods. Oops, sorry about that. It seems like the slides uh, changed a little bit on um, displaying them on this platform. Um, okay, 
So uh, with this idea that we needed more, uh, we needed to find a, a, the perfect, the ideal uh, qualitative tradition to use, we set out to do an analysis of uh, methods. And we came up with this wonderful, uh, we thought, very original idea of using phenomenology, only to realize that uh, two years before, Casey had actually proposed exactly the same to use phenomenology to study learning in the chemistry laboratory. With the exception, I would say that no one had used it before, and she didn't use it. She just proposed it. Um, phenomenology, as well as other concepts in qualitative inquiry, uh, are polysemantic. And when you say the word, it elicits different ideas in different people, and even different ideas in the same individual. And that creates a big problem, because if we do not uh, clarify what we're talking about, communication is very difficult. We've been through that, especially when people think that we're talking about the philosophical tradition, because we do not do philosophical research. So if, if we explain what we do, if we tell you what we do, and you think of uh, the philosophical tradition, there's going to be a mismatch, and communication is going to be poor. One thing that all of these ideas and concepts have in common, must have in common, is that they refer to the human experience as the centerpiece of the study, of the work. So we take a very, what we say is a very um, um, pragmatic approach in terms of using phenomenology. Um, and that, that means that we look at it as um, an, a tool of analysis, an instrument of analysis of our data, not as a philosophical um, camp. We also say that qualitative methods in general, we should start considering them as standalone methods because they are mature enough already in terms of methodology. Um, and we say that it's just um, in chemical analysis. When you use spectroscopy, you don't feel you have to go in and explain uh, the principles of atomic theory, for instance. You don't have to engage in these philosophical discussions. You don't even have to show anybody you can put apart an NMR and then put it back together. Okay, you just use the technique. And that applies as well for things like um, statistics and quantitative analysis. We understand there is um, an amount of criticism about this um, uh, approach especially coming from people who do phenomenology as a philosophical um, tradition. Nonetheless, we say that there are fundamental commitments that must be met for something to be called a phenomenological study. Uh, just the same way that you know, it would be very hard to get away with doing an ethnography without immersing yourself in the culture you're studying. That would be pretty difficult to do. There are some fundamental aspects of phenomenology that must be met in our view. And um, when it doesn't happen that way, we come across a, a problem which is um, confusing phenomenology with studies that take a phenomenological approach. And there are a number of examples of that in the literature. Not that those studies are not worth or important, they are. But maybe we should try to define them in a different way. Um, I've got two examples here, actually, Ostergaard. Um, and collaborators, they published a paper 10 years ago, which says phenomenology, it says in the title something like phenomenological studies in science education. But it describes studies that are not phenomenologies. And most, more recently in SERP, we have a paper that uh, is self-described as a phenomenology. Uh, and we don't think it meets the fundamental commitments. And I'm free to talk about that because that's my friend who published it. So. Um, I'm not going behind anybody's back by saying this, and we've had the discussion already. So let's define phenomenology. Um, we like the way that Patton does it. And he says that uh, qualitative traditions are, are defined by the kind of questions that they address. In the case of phenomenology, that would be um, what is the meaning, structure, and essence of the lived experience of this phenomenon for this person or group of people. Key words here are essence, lived experience, and phenomenon. Again, phenomenology centers on the, the phenomenon, the experience. 
it has to be experienced by the individual who's reporting it, and there must be an essence to that experience that we can extract, and that essence would be a meanings that are commonly shared by the participants or the individuals that went through that experience. Van Manen defines it as, or says that a phenomenology asks for that which makes a something what it is and without which it could not be what it is. Now, I mentioned some basic commitments. What I mean by that is, and again, I'm sorry, but the slides just changed a little bit. Um, from my Mac to, to uh, putting them up in this platform. Um, one of those commitments is the focus. It must be centered on the experience. It must tend, intend to describe the experience. Phenomenology does not intend to explain the experience. We must believe there's an essence, and we have, uh, uh, we have had quite uh, a number of arguments with that because many individuals believe that you cannot extract a single essence or even essences from an experience that would be common to a large group of individuals. Um, and essence is to, we say essence is to phenomenology as culture is to ethnography. If you do not believe in the construct in, in the construct of culture, it's going to be very hard to discuss ethnography. Uh, so the essence uh, would be, for instance, if, if you think of uh, immigrants, the experience of being an immigrant. We do believe that even though the experiences, as experienced by the individuals, are going to be personal and different, we can extract core meanings that are the same for those individuals, that are common to those individuals. So we, we, we must understand that saying that there's an essence is not the same as saying that everybody will have the same experience. That is not the meaning. It has to be a lived experience. We do not use secondhand um, data. Uh, and we've had a bunch of, of different discussions about this before, because people ask us, you know, why don't you interview individuals during the lab experience, for instance. If we did that, um, we would be altering the experience itself. Uh, we even think that it, it, we should not, although some people do it, go in and, and do field uh, observations, because that's secondhand information. And finally, it's got to be retrospective. It cannot be an introspective process. And once again, if we interview the students or the individual during the experience, that's going to change the experience itself because it's going to make them reflect upon the experience while it is happening. That's why we use um, thick, um, we use in-depth uh, in uh, interviews after the experience has occurred. Now, uh, this is common to many qualitative um, um, methods that uh, you see diversity in terms of the procedures and protocols of um, uh, research and analysis. And that raises uh, sometimes questions about the robustness or how strict the methodology may be. Um, that is the case as well with uh, phenomenology, where there are different proposals on how to conduct it. What we do is we go by uh, the protocol that's proposed by Mustakas with just very small modifications. In his proposal, what we do is we take our data, which would be the interviews. For the study I'm going to discuss later, we had like eight interviews, a point at which we reached saturation of data. We transcribe the interviews, and we use some fancy names in this uh, processing, like horizontalization, but, but we are, I'm pretty certain most of us are familiar with the first steps. So we transcribe them, we extract the significant statements, which we also call units of meaning. Then we go through the process of coding, create codes, we cluster them into themes, and, and then we go back and validate our themes with the original uh, data with the transcripts. One thing that we do different from what Mostakas proposes is that we work in group. So for this one study I'm going to discuss later, it was five, we had five researchers, three undergraduates, a grad student, and myself. So each one of us would go through these first steps individually. 
then we would get together, examine the codes and the themes, and come to um, a code list, a code book, and themes that we shared for that first interview. Once we had that, we would go through a process called narration to create a textual description, that is, a narrative that describes what happened in the experience that would be for the first interview. And then we would go back and take the second interview and go through the same process again with the second interview. So each one of us would process each individual um, interview, and then we would get them together and create the individual textual descriptions, one textual description for each interview. So you can imagine the amount of work that that implies. Once we had that, the narrative that describes what happened, we would get together and work on the structural description. That is how the event happened. Uh, this overlap naturally. Uh, you cannot do textual description without start thinking of structural description. Uh, so we separate them the best we can. And then we take the textual descriptions, the structural descriptions for all of the interviews, and we take the, the code book and the themes. We integrate that, all of that, to create what we call the outcome space, which would be the output of the analysis. And the outcome space, the way that we present it typically is a diagrammatic representation accompanied by a narrative that describes in depth the event. And one of the components is typically the essence of that experience. And this is the way that we tell people we do things. We just tell them we have interviews, we put them in this uh, magic machine, and we get out an output. Because uh, uh, explaining that analysis uh, typically takes some time. Um, now, I have never used this analogy in public before. I use it with my students. Um, but what I tell them when we are conducting the research, especially if they are undergraduate researchers, is that um, doing phenomenology would be like, like uh, taking the bottom picture. You can go and take a picture of the Eiffel Tower and just remain at the nominal aspects. You know, this is the Eiffel Tower, but when you do phenomenology, you are trying to get deeper into the description because that's the objective of conducting phenomenology, describing the experience as lived by the participants, but not in the surface, um, but really, really in depth. So the bottom picture, for instance, describes states of emotion, states of mind, and it's artistic, and describe, describes things that are different. So we want phenomenological studies um, to do that. And in this case, we would be like um, equivalent to the photographers. So we have two options. We either take the picture above or the picture below. Now, taking the picture below will require more training, more familiarity with the event, more understanding of what's going on in the event. And probably I shouldn't have put this one up here because it's a little bit pretentious of, of, of me to use one of Godka's painting. Um, but in some ways, I say that uh, abstract expressionism uh, is similar to phenomenology in that it describes that that, can, that is not obvious, that cannot be seen at first sight. Okay. Um, so what I've said about uh, phenomenology so far, one of the most important aspects is that we go into these different learning environments, which we do not have control over. These are not our learning environments. We've worked like in four different learning environments. Um, we are not the designers of the curriculum. We are not instructors. We are not the evaluators. And the reason for that is because we want to avoid any kind of conflict of interest. We apply our methods of phenomenology. We get a thick, deep, thorough description of the event. And that is, in itself, the objective of phenomenology. Now, what we do with that description is up to us. Each individual consumer of research can take it and run with it and do whatever they want or need with it. One of the things we propose is that uh, we can take that and gain deeper understanding of learning in the laboratory. And for instance, as practitioners, we can distill the active ingredients that are transferable to our situation, that match our 
um, objectives for the laboratory programs that we run, and then inform our decisions to conduct redesign or design um, of the laboratory environment. And if needed, we can continue with that process of research. Another thing that we can do is look at this description, and by gaining this better understanding, we can extract theoretical frameworks that will allow us to inform the pedagogical decisions. One thing that we found, and I'm going to talk more about this later, is mindfulness theory. So we say that from, from this kind of exercise, we found mindfulness theory, and we can take it to inform the kind of learning environment we're going to design. At this point, Michael, I don't know if we, if we should take a, a short break to ask questions. Great, yes, thank you. You have a couple of questions coming in. So, um, uh, just to say from RSC, Sarah, point of view, thank you for giving such a nice overview of the, of the um, method you're using. It's a really useful um, part of these webinars. Um, so, I've a couple of questions around the method, really. But the first is, how do you define what a significant statement is, um, and how do you identify them in the data, in the data um, especially I'm, I'm sorry. if all the individual is... Sorry, I'll say the question again. How do you define what a yes. significant statement is? And then subsequently, how do you identify um, how do you identify these significant statements if all of the work has been conducted individually in the first instance? Okay, a significant statement would be um, pretty much any statement that carries a meaning to the individual who's given who's who's been interviewed. Uh, we call it a horizontalization because what it does is it gives all of the meanings the same value. One thing that we do in, in phenomenology is that we do a POG and bracketing, meaning that we extract our prejudice, we separate our experience to the best we can. We know that that's not 100% possible, but we separate our experience and uh, preconceived ideas so that we can give all of the comments coming from the participants the same weight and value. So anything that they say that would carry a meaning would become a significant statement. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and the second part of that question was? Um, well, I, I guess it's, it's related because it, you're essentially saying any individual statement is considered significant, and then you take that sum of, sum of statements to the next step. So I think, I think you've answered the second part as well. Um, yeah, well, yeah. So, so the, the next, it kind of follows on from that. Once you sort of um, arrive at a series of statements, do, do you go back to the participants and do any second interview, or is, is that, would that be a helpful process in other words, to check with them with the outcomes that you're defining? Yeah, we do not do participant checks as, um, as a rule. What we do is um, uh, we can go back and talk to individuals and present them um, our findings, what we have discussed, and we, we can have uh, non-formal discussions with them. What we do, absolutely, what we do is uh, we go back to the coordinators, laboratory coordinators, and we get their experience from the, um, from the event. We interview them, get their experience, and then we present them the work and see if it makes sense to them. Okay, so we yeah. do that sort of, uh, that, that check, we do it through the laboratory coordinators, and um, um, pretty much every single time we've done an, a phenomenological study with students, we have also um, interviews with the TAs, which are not part of the same study, but allow us to see if what we're getting makes sense from the standpoint of view of the TAs, teaching assistants. Yeah, yeah. And do you, is there any sense of developing a kind of an inter-rate reliability or... Uh, I'm, I'm, is that, is that kind of consideration here where you're looking at statements um, from the individual researchers, or is that a consideration? No, we don't do integrated reliability because we work based on consensus, which yeah. is, uh, I understand it's complicated because um, um, it's hard to talk about consensus when you have a one professor, three undergraduates, and one grad student, because we are at different levels, and you know the things that I may say carry interview may carry more uh, relevance than what they, what they think. Um, so what, what we did for this particular study I'm going to discuss, which the group was particularly large, it was five individuals, 
um, I'd retrieve myself from the discussion, I let them discuss, the four of them first, and then I would walk, uh, jump in into the discussion. And the other thing that we did was um, we um, recorded all of our interactions. The, the weekly meetings, uh, all of them were recorded. And that would allow me uh, to go back and listen to the recordings again, to detect possible scenarios where um, inequality of power in terms of the research might taint the conclusions. Because it would be very easy uh, to conclude what I wanted and not what the group wanted. So we do not do integrated reliability. That's not applicable um, uh, in this case because we're not transforming. We're not transforming quant to quant data. Yeah, yeah. And then the last question I think for now is: Is there a time dimension to this data? In other words, if you're using this, sorry, to this approach, if you're using this approach, is it sort of of a particular time, or is it something that could be considered in a longitudinal study? Uh, let's see if I understand the question. I, we, we, we do the study um, at the end of the experience. So it is not yeah. longitudinal in that sense. Okay. Um, we, cannot, we cannot conduct the study. Uh, the other people have done things like that. They would interview students at the beginning, in the middle of the um, experience, and at the end of the experience. But uh, philosophically, that is not consistent with the way that we look at phenomenology. So the study is a, a one-time data collection at the end of the experience. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. OK, I, I, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you very much. All righty. So having discussed so, the... Sorry, actually, I'll interrupt just one, for one moment. And yes. I'm say I'm, I have a PDF version of your talk here, which I will share instead, um, because the, the text should be OK on that. So okay. I'll just put that up on slide 26. Um, um, well, I was saying since since we've discussed some of the um, aspects of qualitative uh, of phenomenology, I'm going to tell you some of the things we've done in terms of a particular study. This study was published uh, not very long ago, uh, but I want to use it so that I can show you where it took us to next. Okay, so we were very lucky to be at I say at the right uh, in the right place at the right time because we had access to a, an institution that was transforming the laboratory program from one that was more traditional to one that was less traditional. And think here, more traditional verification type and less traditional um, cooperative um, uh, project-based type. And they worked for nine months on, on putting together this um, reform. And somehow they made this decision of uh, going all the way with 1,600 students and change every single section over the Christmas break, which we did not have any say in this matter because we were not instructors or coordinators. Uh, but we would have um, advised against because they did not do any pilot testing at any point. It was great for us because it gave us a chance to have a large number of students that had experienced one full semester of traditional labs and one full semester of less traditional laboratories which is very uncommon. We saw an opportunity here in the sense that um, most typically studies are done with a single instructional style in a single institution where all of the students that have been um, a part of the, of the study uh, have experienced only one uh, instructional style. So this was divergent, this was different situation, different information, and we believe it could give us a different uh, perspective on learning in the laboratory. Um, so we set up, uh, well, this changed a little bit too. The, the PDF um, um, is a little bit different from what it should have been, but, um, but it looks good enough. Um, so we created a question that has to, has to be phrased, worded in a, in a way that's consistent with phenomenology. Uh, for instance, phenomenology cannot ask, how do students learn this material best? That's not a phenomenological question. Okay, the, uh, the phenomenological question has to go in and try to figure out what the experience was and how it was experienced, because it does not intend to explain things. 
So we come up with the question, how do students experience change in the laboratory format from more traditional to less traditional? The phenomenon was the change and not the experiences of the two different laboratories, individual laboratories. The first one was, as I mentioned, cookbook type. Uh, you had quizzes every week, you had um, ex different experiments every week, you had reports every week, um, there were lectures before the labs, um, students worked in Paris, very traditional. And the reformed one was uh, project-based, uh, groups of three or four students, they had only four projects over the course of the semester, um, there were no exams, no pre-labs, uh, no quizzes, uh, reports were oral presentations or posters. They did peer reviews and peer assessment, all of that kind of things. Okay, so with that, um, we went in and we collected our interviews from students. We had no problem getting volunteers to be interviewed at that institution. Uh, we did our data analysis. And we came up with the outcome space, which looks like this. Again, these slides look a little bit different from what they uh, were meant to be. Um, the outcome space has three main features or components. Uh, we have here the environment one, the, the first laboratory and the second laboratory. And it shows the experience of change in between, which we know it doesn't happen in between. It actually happens during the second semester, but there's no way that we could represent that graphically. Uh, and the three main features are uh, the ability of the students to describe the learning environments very accurately. This is interesting because um, it's been shown for, the first time was back in the 80s by Abraham, that the students are quite capable of understand the code and describe the learning environments, the instructional styles that um, are being used. It was important for us that to see this because we needed some sort of um, evidence for the fidelity of the implementations, because it was essential for us to be sure that the experiences were actually different. Um, and some instructors may not think that students are capable of this level of uh, reflection, but they are. The second feature of this outcome space is what we call the vectors of change, which are the dimensions along which the students experienced change. And I must say that the outcome space is common to all of the participants, regardless of the preference for one style of laboratory or the other. Okay? Um, so these vectors of change, again, are the dimensions in which they experience change. For instance, we have um, the role of the student. They all agreed, regardless of the preference for one or the other, that the role of the student changed, and it changed in the same way. And so for the other axis of our vectors of change, which I will not discuss in detail here unless you all have a, a questions. Uh, and the third aspect or feature of this outcome space is the one that interests me the most at this time, is that the students went from a state of mindlessness in the more traditional laboratory to a state of mindfulness in the, uh, in the less traditional laboratory. Okay? Uh, and this came actually from the undergraduate students, from the analysis of the undergrad students. We were struggling with finding the essence or essences. And one of them came back to one of our meetings with, with this proposal, which made a lot of sense for the rest of us. So, when we figured that out, what we had to do was go back to the data and try to find the evidence that would support that claim, that that was an essential aspect of um, the experience. And here we have something that one of, a quote by one of the students, Bart, he said, chemistry one format where you just do what you're told, almost. I don't want to say mindlessly, because you have to be conscious of what you're doing but you just kind of go forward with it without thinking why you're doing it. So that describes uh, a state of mindlessness. And Bart did something that I really like, um, his next comment, which may be off, a little bit off topic here, but he said, I'm interested in chemistry. So in the Chem 1 lab, the traditional one, 
while you could have gone through it mindlessly, I actually was trying to think about some of the chemistry behind it. And I say this is relevant to me because quite often we hear our colleagues tell us, well, if this lab worked for me, it should work for them as well. But Bart is very, very smartly telling us, you know, it worked for me because I made it work for me. So it reminds us that despite what the learning environment environment may be, if you are fully devoted, motivated, and interested, you can make it work, which would be most probably the case for most current uh, chemistry professors when they were uh, taking general chemistry. And, and again, we cannot, we all know we cannot generalize our experience to that of other students who are not going to become chemistry professors. So anyhow, we go back and we look at the data and we extract uh, instances in which uh, we get the students who are telling us things that support this idea that they went from mindlessness to mindfulness. Um, Kate said last year it was like in the traditional lab, it was like read do this, read do this. I didn't even know what I was doing to be honest. But in the less traditional lab, I feel like we, were, we learned more because it's like they don't tell you what to do. You have to do it what you want. It's like your decision. So you have to do your background and from your background information, you do your lab and I learned a lot personally. When I get to the lab, I am actually doing it myself. So we collected all of this information that supported our uh, proposal of a transition from mindlessness state to mindfulness state. And I'm not gonna read all of the quotes here. And um, so it, being consistent with our understanding of phenomenological approaches, what we say is that we have created a thick, deep, thorough description of the event, of the phenomenon, that is available for those that want to do research or the practitioners that want to do curricular uh, changes. Take that description, see how it transfers to our own context and situations, and inform our decisions using it. Uh, there's something else we say as well. Uh, it goes further from what phenomenology would do, and that is that we suggest people can use the concepts of mindfulness and the theory of mindfulness I'm going to talk later on about to design their learning experiences. But in essence, being very strict with the ideas of phenomenology, this is what we do. We present the thick description, thorough description of the learning environment, and individual consumers of research can use it for their own purposes. Now, uh, I showed you this diagram before. We have the description. We can go and do look at the active ingredients and inform the uh, redesign. Or we can also find new theoretical frameworks that can inform the redesign. In our case, we take this theoretical framework now and we use it for research purposes. And it, this came out of this phenomenological study. So what we, what we did was we, came, we, we let this idea of mindfulness emerge from the qualitative data. And after that, we were uh, continuing research and doing work. And we came across the theory of mindfulness by Professor Langer. She's at Harvard. And what we're doing now, uh, a spin-off of this project, is we propose uh, to use mindfulness theory as a unifying lens to re-examine learning in the laboratory using articles that have been published before. Uh, let me define mindfulness. And I'm going to use Dr. Langer's words here. The subjective feel of mindfulness is that of a heightened state of involvement and wakefulness, or being in the present. And I think it's a lot easier to define it as in opposition to mindlessness. Mindlessness would be uh, you know, having your brain unplugged. I'm going to have to hurry up a little bit here because I don't want to run, run out of time. <clears throat> so the first thing we did was we, we decided to look into um, how well we could, dis could we distinguish the two learning environments that I just presented in the previous study and distinguish those two using mindfulness theory as a coding system because we extracted that information from the students' responses. And now we want to see if it matches what mindfulness theory says. 
there are a lot of benefits associated in the literature with mindfulness, uh, states of mindfulness. One of them that's very relevant for us is that when you are in a mindfulness state, you're more open to receive information and to process it. And I, I bet we all agree that's a, uh, that's a fundamental condition for significant meaningful learning. You have to be uh, in the disposition to uh, receive information and to process it. That's one of the benefits of mindfulness uh, state. Um, some of work has been done in education, and um, they have come up with these factors that promote mindlessness or mindfulness behavior in learning environments. Mindlessness is promoted by reliance upon the past, rules and routines, overstructured foolproof experiences, perspective free instruction, and emphasis on learning the basics and paying attention. And mindfulness is promoted when the individual is situated in the present. Uh, it is aware, he or she is aware of context and perspective. They're, they are allowed um, to self control, plan, and make decisions. We use conditional instruction, and there's variation of stimuli and change and questioning. So, what we did was we used this, the, this theoretical frame, framework, as a way to code the interviews that we had from our uh, phenomenological study. Just one example here Mind mindfulness inducing would be learning the basics and paying attention. Anna, which was a student who hated the reformed labs, uh, said of the traditional labs that she learned how to use the burettes. She learned how to properly use the filters and stuff. So that's what you should learn in Chemistry 1, knowing how to do things which take us to the basics and paying attention. Referring to the lab that she didn't like, the non-traditional lab, she said, I don't know what it was like before the new system came in. I would just think it's about learning how to apply what you've learned, learning how to conduct experiments, how to problem solve in a sense, which is what I saw. And we relate that to variation of stimuli, change, and questioning. So by <clears throat> looking at the interviews, I'm not going to read all these quotes, uh, there's no Surprise, and I'm sorry, there are words missing here. Um, there's no surprise that the learning environment, which was non traditional, associated very well with a, a learning environment that promoted mindfulness, mindful engagement. And the cookbook type promoted a learning environment which was um, driven by mindlessness, which is uh, very easy for us. Uh, well, I think that that just fixed itself. Okay, it, it was very easy for us because that was our um, hypothesis. So it's it's rather simple to find supporting evidence for your uh, hypothesis. Um, so what we did was to counteract that. We did a follow-up study in which <clears throat> we took all of the papers we found that were published between uh, year 2000 and 2017 regarding chemistry laboratories, academic laboratories, that had student quotes. And a team of four individuals, myself, a grad student, and two undergraduates, we coded all of those statements, these quotes. Um, we did blind coding using uh, mindfulness theory as the theoretical framework. And we also gave it to 25 science professors from a different institution. They were split in groups of four, three or four. They were explained the theory of mindfulness uh, shortly, like in 20 minutes. And then we gave them the strips of paper with the quotes, and we asked them to organize them according to internal consistency in two groups. And they did. And then we asked them to classify one group as mindfulness inducing and the other one as mindlessness. Once we had that, the two groups coded by those of 31 individuals, uh, I'm sorry, 29 individuals. Uh, we looked at the association of that with the way that they were described in literature. And needless to say, uh, it matched what, what we had seen before. This is an actual, a picture of an actual Excel document from one of the students. In red, we have the mismatches or the misalignments in, in the coding. Uh, this would be the team of researchers, and this would be, I'm sorry, this would be the team of researchers. And this would be the faculty members in groups of three or four. Okay, 
And again, what we saw was that the, the, whatever was described in literature as traditional was coded as um, an environment that promoted mindless, mindlessness. Whatever was in the literature presented as non-traditional uh, coincided with the description of mindfulness. And here what I have is a number of quotes that come from different papers published uh, in the literature. This come from Domin's paper back in 07, where one of the students says, uh, comparing expository versus problem-based laboratories, uh, the spring semester, which was expository, you had to actually go to the lab. Okay, So that's the kind of quotes that we um, studied. I'm not going to read them all. Just leave them there. So if you want to come back and watch the video, you will have access to them. And the last thing I want to say in a, just a couple of minutes is that it is important for us to make sure that all of this work uh, has some concrete application. You know, we see something practical coming out of it. As I mentioned at the beginning, the um, Laboratories at the UCR are very traditional, the service laboratories. We've been reforming the laboratories for chemistry majors over the past two years. And we have come up with this um, idea of creating what we call multimodal labs. The multimodal labs are labs that are not based on a single individual instructional style. Because we have come up uh, to the conclusion that uh, we cannot, we don't want to be very we don't want to be prescriptive and tell people how to teach their labs. And we do not believe a single instructional style is going to give students all they need to do their learning. So these multimodal labs are designed using things, uh, integrated course design. We use a lot um, Michelin Chi's um, ICAP framework to design the activities. Uh, we have a flexible program, which is logistically a, a problem because uh, the institution demands that we have a chronogram with every single thing that's going to be done in the course of the 16 weeks. So we have that, but um, don't go by it necessarily. For instance, this, uh, two weeks ago, students asked us, the students in Chemistry 2, asked us to include a um, kinetics pro um, project. So we, we selected three of them from the same students, and they found one, and they pilot tested it already so their peers can, can, can work on it. Um, we have parallel projects along with uh, individual experiments. So students in Chemistry 1, for instance, the first week of classes, our students come to the institution, they have, most of them have zero experience in the laboratory, unfortunately. Um, and the first week of, the, of, of Chemistry 1, we tell them they need to get together in groups of four and devise a way to measure the length of a molecule. They panic at that idea. We all know there are very simple ways to do this, but they panic at that idea. That's a project they do for four weeks, work on that for four or five weeks, but at the same time, they're coming to the lab to perform other labs. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, we are fortunate that we get six hours of um, contact with the students per week. Uh, we do a lot of team and individual work in these laboratories because it is important for our uh, uh, work, a job market, that students are very competent in individual work. Um, we appreciate and it is important uh, teamwork, but we cannot neglect in our context um, the relevance of independent work. Students do things like video reports, they attend talks. We do technique badges now. Uh, we incorporate green chemistry and ethics in the, in the learning environment as well. Um, and hopefully in, 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 in a short time you'll be able to read something of this, some of this, in the literature. And I hope I have not gone too fast. Um, and I reach here at the end of the talk. I want to thank you for your attention. Thank again Michael for the opportunity, and I want to invite you all uh, to submit an abstract for the upcoming ACS Spring National Meeting, which is going to happen in Orlando by the end of March. And I am organizing a symposium there on research on learning in the laboratory. And this symposium is annual, and we've done it for nine years now. And unfortunately, the abstract submission closes this coming Monday. 
Uh, but uh, I would be delighted if some of you would um, be interested in sending uh, an abstract. And uh, thanks again. And thank you, Michael. Thank you uh, very much, um, Santiago. It was really interesting. Um, there's an awful lot of questions, so I'll, I'll do my best to try and um, pick the main ones in terms of relating to your data that you presented. So I'll, I'll just read them out direct so I, 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 it's most efficient. So the first one that comes to mind is about the process again, the interview process. How did you structure your interviews to elicit responses about all of the vectors of change that you showed? I must say that, that communication is breaking up a little bit with you. So I'm, 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 I think you asked about the interviewing process. Yeah, so to get correct? The, the detail of the, all the vectors of change, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, the, the interviewing process, it, it is, um, interviewing is difficult, yeah, especially for phenomenological uh, purposes, because what you want to do is you want the individuals to bring their lived experience to consciousness, because we say that only, only through consciousness is that we actually can reach, we can access the experience itself. Um, what we did was I had a grad student who was very well trained in interviewing. The protocol is very, very um, uh, open-ended, and we say it's semi-structured, but it's pretty much unstructured. And what we do is uh, we ask them to tell us about the experience. Um, uh, in this case, we would call, we would, we tried to get them to recall what your first laboratory was like and the second laboratory was like. We do not go in and ask them, tell me about the changes that happened when you went from one to the other, because that would be, that would invalidate our purpose. Uh, we don't want to ask guiding questions. Uh, for instance, you cannot ask them, tell me something that was good about your second laboratory or something was different. So it's just getting them in the, in the right mood and situation to talk about the experience itself. Um, and the, the, the role of the um, um, interviewer, I say, I, you know, I would tell my, my grad students, is like a, a therapist. You are there to listen and not to tell. Okay? Um, so that's, that's, that's complicated. Um, and what I do with them as well is I would listen to the interviews, every individual interview that's done by a grad student, I will listen to it afterwards and discuss it with them and try to identify places where the where, uh, interview did not go well so that we can rectify. Great, thank you. Um, the order of your labs were the traditional lab first and then the, um, the innovative lab, Less traditional lab. Do you think that affected the results that you saw? The order was uh, non-traditional. I mean, traditional and then non-traditional. Yeah. And what was the question? Uh, do you think that 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 affected the results that you saw? In other words, the students had experience of the traditional first and then the non-traditional. Um, yes and no. I say no because we won't know until we do the exp the study. Okay, there's no way we can predict if there would be a difference. Um, I, the, the, the one thing I can tell you is that we've done um, phenomenological studies in which students would enter chemistry one and they would come to a learning environment which was very similar to the second semester of this study. And the interviews, the outcome, what the students report was very, very similar. For instance, and when they came to Chemistry 1 and it was cooperative project based, they would tell us or we would extract out of that uh, interviews that there was a time that it would take them to fully understand how the laboratory operated. And that was typically one full project. This was for the, when they encountered this environment for the first semester. When they encountered it for the second semester after being in a traditional lab, we saw exactly the same. That report uh, that um, understanding the workings of the laboratory would take time. And which is very interesting is that when they walked into a traditional lab, it takes them no time to under understand how it operates. So as we say, the traditional lab, they can explain it as a snapshot, just yeah. you know, fixed in time, uh, st static. Whereas the um, non-traditional lab, it's a, an evolving experience. We saw that in, in students that had it for the first semester, students who had it for the second semester. But again, the only way to determine that would be 
if we were lucky enough um, to see something similar. I can tell you that Domin, Daniel, uh, one of his papers from uh, 2007, he had students in a uh, problem-based laboratory the first semester, and then the second semester he had him in a traditional lab. Uh, so it, it may be interesting to reread that paper and see what he said. Yeah. All right, we are we are out of time. Thank you very much, Santiago. There's lots of virtual applause around the world, um, thanking you for your talk. There were lots more questions, so I will I will aim to copy those and send them to you so you have a record. Right. Um, Next month we have Scott Lewis from USF, who I think you know Santiago. Scott is a really great speaker as well. So you are very welcome everybody to join us in that talk. And it just leaves me to thank Santiago again very much for your really interesting talk, both in terms of informing us about methodology and seeing how it applies in practice and then the sort of impact and, and um, the concept of mindfulness theory and how we can think about that in our lab work. So thank you very much, Santiago. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you to everybody who attended. Bye now.